Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base. JonesWalker.com. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. And by Wyndham Garden Lafayette. From Spoonbill Restaurant in downtown Lafayette, we're out to lunch with Christian Mader, publisher and editor of The Current. It's business Acadiana style. Hi, welcome to Out to Lunch. I'm Christian Mader. How often is it that we aim for one career and land in another? You go to college to be a painter and you end up a graphic designer, or you study philosophy and end up a lawyer. The two certainly have a lot in common. I venture to say that most of us don't land where we set our career ambitions. We're lucky if we can do work we love on nights and weekends. And it's the rare person who knows exactly what they want to do and end up doing it for money. What do you want to be when you grow up? For most of us, employ. And that means you're still one of the lucky ones if you can find meaning in your work and the opportunity to express yourself. My guests today both thrive in careers that are perhaps only slightly different than the ones they imagine for themselves. The basic elements of their ambitions and skills are in place. Artfulness, creativity, compassion, and taste. Virginia Getting wanted to be an art therapist. She got her degree in fine arts, but left school a nomad. She hitched a ride to a brief career in Louisiana's film industry, but ultimately landed in cosmetology and has worked in the industry for the last 10 years. For every client in her chair at Salon V in downtown Lafayette, she gets to sculpt new looks and lend a sympathetic ear. Sounds like art therapy to me. Virginia, welcome to Out to Lunch. Thanks. Mia Sandberg got her start in interior design, but she didn't find her calling till her husband brought her flowers. The arrangement was a funky little thing, unusual and earthy. It spoke to her. When they landed back in Lafayette, she needed a new gig. Why not flowers, she thought. She launched Root Floral Design in a shack behind her parents' house. The firm has grown into an in-demand florist for weddings and big events. And Mia has a knack for unconventional arrangements with rich textures and unusual blossoms. This is interior design with living, breathing materials, and business is growing. Mia, welcome to Out to Lunch. Hello. Okay. Um, So Mia, you pretty much picked up the flower business on a a whim, right? Um, What was the hardest part of jumping into it? (sighs) Um, (laughs) Let's see. Well, not knowing how to start a business, that's probably... (laughs) Probably the biggest, the hardest part, yeah. So, um, and then I had never actually worked in floral, in the floral industry at all, or touched flowers. <laughs> I just knew that I was drawn to the color aspect and, you know, the the design aspect of it. And I was, like, I had a background of, like, with doing design, I guess. So, um, I don't know. That's what drew it drew me to it but yeah I would say just not knowing how to start a business <laughs> so I pretty much had to figure it all out as I went but like what what do you mean by not knowing how to start a business like what was the business aspect of it that you thought was I surprising mean, or daunting yeah like buying a building to put you know all the stuff in figuring out what all the stuff was that I needed for the business um, because I had never worked at a flower shop, I didn't know exactly what I needed to, you know, get it done. So I just, I looked it up and asked people and, um, had to get permits and licenses and, uh, Louisiana is actually the only state in the country that requires a floral license. So like, like a doctor needs a license, you know, people who have really important jobs. Uh, yeah. So we're the only state that requires a florist to be licensed to practice floristry. Okay. Um, So Virginia, I mean, what about you? I mean, I imagine there had to be some aspect of getting into, you know, cosmetology that you're like, wait, I didn't know that was part of the game. What was it? What was that thing for you? You know, uh, whenever I look back, like I'm always kind of surprised that it took me as long as it did to get into cosmetology. I just never considered it like a career path. But I I started cutting all my friend's hair in college. You know, all these art students, they're game for anything. So, you know, I started with kitchen cuts, and that went fairly well. I I ended up kind of doing it consistently for a couple people. But still, I just thought it was something that I enjoyed doing, and it was creating art on someone's head, like, which is gratifying, you know. Um, And then also, like, 
kind of resolving issues people were having like this just isn't working why is this why is it not working and again it's like the same thing there's a design element to it and uh so i found that enjoyable what was something that you walked in and said oh well, this is different i mean this is i didn't know this is something i needed to know one of my character flaws is i can be overly uh confident about things so i went in and i was like yeah i can do this i can totally do this and then uh I guess the humility of learning that, like, you may have an idea of things, but if you're going to repeat the same product, you there's a reason they have formulas that you have to plug into. Like, subscribing to the idea that there are certain basic haircuts and things like that that you have to learn uh, so that you can apply them effectively, repeatedly. Because I loved, like, this whole idea of, like, yeah, I'm going to go in, it's going to be this organic process, and it's going to be great. But, like, if I'm going to repeat that next month, I have to have some kind of system. So I think that that was my little, like, come to Jesus, is that, like, hey, you're going to have to do this consistently. You can't, like, just fly by the seat of your pants all the time. And the same thing with, like, color and stuff like that. Uh, it was just fi finding a more systematic approach rather than something that was completely organic. Right, so it's sort of like you had to realize that, you just couldn't wing it, right? That you had to. You can't just wing. Yeah. You can't wing it every time. So Mia, I mean, I'm curious. You know, you, you pick up this as a skill set. I mean, how did you actually learn to go from? You know, I imagine the first time maybe you pick up some 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 flowers or some plants and like you're like, wait, wait, I actually have to. There's a design process to this. There's a strategy to it. What, how did you learn to do that? Yeah. Um. Well, <laughs> I think it was just day to day. It was trial and error, I guess. Um, I made a lot of mistakes at the beginning and I started off very small so I started off with what I thought would be the easiest which was just everyday arrangements um, and then I quickly realized like oh like this is actually a lot more than like I thought it was gonna be um, so I moved to weddings because I can you know plan out weddings but weddings are a whole other beast you know in themselves and I mean I've killed a lot of flowers I froze flowers I uh, stuffed them all into one cooler thinking like yeah like they're in the cold like this is great but they all froze so it was a lot of trial and error and I you know I studied and I took the test and I got my license so I did learn a little bit you know while I did that but a lot of it was just figuring it out as I went and asking people and I did workshops like I went to um, workshops with famous florists, you know, in other states, and so I just kind of like tried to learn as much as I could on my own, I guess. But um, yeah, it was definitely a lot of a lot of mistakes. What are famous florists like? <laughs> it's a whole thing. It's yeah. a thing. Okay. Instagram. <laughs> I whenever I started the business, Instagram was like just getting to be a thing. So. There wasn't a lot out there at that point, but a couple of years in is when I, for you know, I really got to find different floors. But like Bows and Arrows was like one of the first ones that I found, and they're out of Dallas and amazing. They're amazing. So I, she was like the first workshop I attended and um, learned a lot of things <laughs> from that. But yeah, famous florists are like, I mean, they have so many workshops. People pay lots of money to attend them, and it's really just like. You know, you learn a lot about the business and you learn a lot about design and installations. And I mean, it's a whole a whole world. Yeah, <laughs> I, it's interesting. I mean, I wonder, uh, Virginia, I imagine it's sort of the same thing in your world. Like, because I'm picturing a lot of like Instagram influencer type things. Like, oh, like, yeah. like my wife watches these videos where like, you know, there's a cake that gets made. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. So, yeah. so is that something oh, yeah. that, that you have to like, you know, in your business now, you really have to account for trends that are happening on social media? I mean, how do you do that? Uh, yeah, I, I think that it, I think it works in two ways. I think that a lot of times people uh, might gain more credit than, than they're deserving uh, on those social media platforms because it's like you go, you do something right, and then you gain this acclaim for doing something, but it doesn't mean that you're the best at what you do. It just means that like you've kind of you're good at advertising, you know? But one of the things that I do like is I think that it kind of forces you to stay current because you're seeing what's happening everywhere. And, you know, you're kind of seeing what people might be leaning toward, be it a trend or, um, well, I, I mean, it's mostly a tr mostly trends, you know? Um, 
But I like it because I think that it kind of helps you to uh, hone your craft further because you're like you you know what's out there because it's I don't know it's so accessible. Do Do you think that there's going to be like I don't know I read the other day that you know Instagram is going to have to like turn off the likes right I mean is that do you think it's going to have an impact on the way this works for you I mean or like the way that you know I, I don't take that you know you're posting haircuts or floral arrangements on Instagram to get right. people to buzz but I mean like right. how is that actually impacting your industry I mean the way that or, or do people come in with like expectations that you can't meet not Abs- because of your skill set but because like hey that's a world that's not actually real yeah absolutely and that, that's kind of what I was saying like you know a lot of people are credited with um, with achieving certain things uh, in their craft but what we don't see is the 15 18 hours that it took to get this black-haired woman to this unicorn of a, you know, lady, um, whatever, oh, maybe it's a man unicorn, I don't know, yeah, but sure. uh, why not? Yeah. But yeah, it, the, the fact that it's, it's not really, it's portrayed as reality, but it's not reality, you know, um, and that there's a lot of work that goes on in between. Mia, I'm curious, I mean, you know, when it comes to the expectations, right, I mean, something you guys both do is work in the bridal industry, I mean... How does that really vary for you in terms of dealing with clients that, you know, aren't for a wedding or versus the you know, folks like, I don't know, something that's more commercial? I mean, what are those expectations like? What that, what's that pressure like? Well, yeah, I mean, dealing with just a person who's having an event is, like, way less stressful <laughs> than, like, a wedding. A wedding is, like, I mean, an event is one day, too, but I don't know. A wedding is just, like, it's their most, one of their most important days, and, like, a lot of pressure if you know I have so much anxiety about this like I can't even tell you guys <laughs> but it's like flowers die they you know you don't know you don't know sometimes they just die and sometimes they come in bad sometimes you don't get what you ordered and they expect you know what you tell them you're gonna give them and it's hard whenever it doesn't happen for them but um yeah I mean there's a lot more pressure when it comes to weddings, I think. and um, But you just have to set them up and just let them know ahead of time that, you know, we do our absolute best to provide you with everything that we're telling you you're going to get. And, you know, but there's always a chance. There's always a chance. Weather, fires in California, it's affecting the floral industry. It's like, you know, there's a strike in Ecuador with, like, rose, the rose farmers. So it's like so many things, and um, I don't know. It's always a challenge. Yeah, I, I to, considered that there would be your supply lines could be sort of oh, internationally. Absolutely, affected. yeah, hundred percent. So we're the bottom, you know, we're the we're the end of the line. It's like we, there's so many pro, there's so many um, people that the flowers go through before they get to us. So it's like we don't have control over it. You know, we just hope that we get it and and also another thing is like what they see on Instagram is it's harder because it's like it's in different parts of the country and so like one flower is a lot more accessible in this part of the country and it's not really that accessible in our part so to tell them that like we can try but like it may cost you $50 for a pack of five blooms you know it's like so it's, it's hard to tell them that, to break their hearts <laughs> when they really want something. But a lot of them trust us enough. You know, they've seen our work. They know what we do. So it's like, I feel like now we're to a point where they're like, it's fine. Like, if you can't get it, it's totally cool. Just like, you know, I trust you guys to make it pretty no matter what. So it's pretty good now, but... I mean, Virginia, how, do, how about you? I mean, do you find that, obviously, I would assume cutting a bride's hair or groom's hair, perhaps, is, is different than if I walk into your chair and say, gussy me up? I mean... Yeah, weddings are really crazy. Like Mia said, they, tensions are high, emotions are running high. Like, so a lot of times, you know, I'm hired also to do, like, hair and makeup for weddings. So I go in kind of knowing that, like, it is just so important that I bring the calm with me. Because, like, it, it's just... Everybody's kind of bald, all this stuff up in one day, and that, that makes it a real challenge. And it does. It kind of raises the stakes for me just to go ahead and perform to the best of my ability. But also I try to, like, kind of 
like I said, bring some calm into the situation and know that like people who are usually very sane might be less so that day. Yeah. And it's it's an, it's understandable. Like, you know, it used to be something that like I kind of felt like a real personal responsibility for, but it's like it just kind of is. And at some point you have to accept that and just say, okay, what are we going to do with this? What can I do to make this right? You know, um, but yeah, I mean, weddings, weddings are really something. How do you bring the calm? I mean, was that something that came naturally to you? Is it just your your demeanor or was or is, did you have a technique that you have I, to no I think it's just like it's a conscious effort just to be like you know what people are gonna be might not be their best selves today so I'm gonna have to kind of try to make up the difference for that so that this day goes smoothly and that so because a lot of there's um I feel like there's like this weird psychology about hair one day I'll write a book <laughs> but um you know, and I, th- I think that it's human nature, too, for people to kind of uh, project their feelings about themselves or uh, emotional plane that they're on onto their appearance. Um, so I think just kind of having a knowledge of that and saying, okay, like, I have been doing the same color formula on this lady for 10 years, but she's having a personal crisis. So today it might be too dark, you know. But, like, the science is there. That's not... But it's okay. Just accepting that, like, that's just where we are. And we'll fix it. You know? It's kind of a weird thing. You're listening to Out to Lunch. I'm Christian Mater. I'm speaking with Virginia Gadding of Salon NV and Mia Sandberg of Root Floral Design. We'll be right back. You're listening to Out to Lunch. I'm Christian Mater. I'm speaking with hair and makeup artist Virginia Gadding and Mia Sandberg of Root Floral Designs. Uh, Me and Virginia, let's take a break from business for a second. This is a segment we call The Checklist. I've got an assortment of pretty random questions that are scientifically engineered to tell us something revealing about you. Uh, I'm going to ask each of you to pick a number between 1 and 25, and I want you to be as honest as you can. Okay, so Virginia, between 1 and 25, let's start with you. I'll I'll pick 7. This is, this is appropriate. I like this. <laughs> what would make you consider leaving Lafayette? I think I could, I, I'd probably, I would venture out, but I still feel like Lafayette is very much home to me. So it would have to be like, I'd have to be like forced out. I'd have to be forced out of Lafayette. <laughs> like Virginia cannot return. Um, no, but I think... Uh, so you'd have to, like, commit a crime and then say... I'd have to be on the run. You're not yeah, allowed on the lam. to put your, <laughs> yeah. put your face on a billboard outside city no. limits and say, don't come back. Yeah. No, I, I think... Um, I could see it being a career-driven move if I ever did move, but it, it would have to be something pretty pretty weighty. Like, I would, it, it would have to really mean something to me to get out of here. Just because this is... I guess it's just because this is my home. I ha- it hadn't given me any good reasons to leave yet. So don't start now. No, I'm just joking. Um, I don't know. That, that's a really hard question. I should have chosen a different number. Like I said, <laughs> um, scientifically engineered. Yeah. Um, okay, Mia, why don't you pick a number between 1 and 25? Uh, two. Two, okay. Um, what advice would you give to a new employee at Root Floral Design? Oh, gosh. Pretty much, we just throw them in, you know? We throw them to the wolves. Um, I don't have time to, you know, watch someone on their every move. So they just have to like learn, learn quick. <laughs> I wouldn't. I mean, you think you would think of floral design, right? And maybe, uh, maybe it's just a thing in movies where it's like there's there's a level of peace about it. But it sounds like this is a, a real, real boiler room type situation um, at Root yeah. Floral Design. Yeah. Like some days, some weeks are slower than others. You know, there's time to. You look at every design and, you know, um, but some weeks, like this week, the past two weeks, I don't have time to look at every single thing. And so, like, I just need, I just need everyone. And also just to ask questions, because that's honestly, if you're not asking me questions, like, if you're unsure about something, like, that's one of my biggest things. Like, I need you to, like, come to me to... What do you find is the hardest thing for new employees to pick up? Oh, the design, just the design aspect, because not everyone is a designer, you know? Like, I can't expect everyone to learn that. But there's a lot more that goes into it than just designing, you know? There's prep work, there's 
so many hard goods. There's prepping of the bases. There's, I mean, we make installation pieces that have to be made like ahead of time before we get to the wedding setup. Um, so yeah, there's, I guess the design part is the hardest part and I don't trust a lot of people to do that yet, so. So, you know, Virginia, I'm curious, um, the same for you, I mean, like, is it, obviously like, you know, typically it's sort of an independent contractor kind of thing, you work for yourself, I know you right. don't really have like an employee, but what's the hardest thing for people to really pick up in hair and makeup artistry? I feel like, um, I feel like there's a really interesting balance that you have to have between humility and confidence. Um, you have to realize, kind of like I stated earlier, that you don't know everything and that there's always something to learn. And I also feel like, kind of as Mia stated, there is uh, typically, like, there there's going to be a ladder. Like, I had a very unique situation where I finished hair school, I made a few people happy enough to stick with me, and, and then I was able to start my own business. And, and that's not really the case for a lot of hairdressers. A lot of times you're going to start off as someone's, um, like, assistant, and you're going to be doing, like, a lot of, like, hair washing or, like, you know, like, the, the equivalent to, like, cleaning buckets, and you're slowly going to, like, work your way up. You know, like, that that's hard on your back. Like, the, the, like, there's a lot of physical work that goes into what we do. Like, it's hard on our bodies, and sometimes you're going to get the brunt of that initially, and you kind of just have to say... But there's always something to learn, and I'm just going to keep getting better. I'm going to keep honing my skills. And if you're lucky, like, I had, like, a good mentor. the Lori, who owns the salon, she mentored me in more ways than one, you know, as a business person and then also as, like, just a creative. Uh, but I feel like an openness to learning new things, a humility in knowing that you're going to fail, and then also... Um, realizing that there is a business attached to your creative endeavor um, because I, I feel like a lot of times um, hairstylists we're not necessarily the best business people we just know that we're doing something that feeds our spirit in a certain way um, but there there is money attached to it and there are there's an overhead that comes along with it so uh, I, I think that that's another thing that I, I wish that stylists would uh, maybe people would enlighten stylists a little bit like hey you know there, there's a big business element to this also take that into account and then this is a lot of an answer but I'm just gonna but also like the psychology thing that I talked about earlier like there's gonna be a huge there might be a, a really big emotional element to this and you may not have seen it coming but it's it's coming and it's gonna be a, a constant so you, you have to be prepared for that. And that's why you have to be secure in your ability because you're going to question yourself a lot. But know that that doesn't mean that you're failing. It means that you care about what you do and it's going to make you better long term. And it's good to care about people because what you're doing, they're stuck with. Like they're going to be wearing it around on their head. So you yeah, should absolutely. care. It's a, it's a collaboration, you know. So those are, that would be my list for yeah. my new employee. Mia, yeah, earlier you mentioned that, um, you know, some of the things that, that have direct impact on your business, right? Like, you know, the fact that these raging forest fires in California, that that has an immediate... I mean, what are, what are the generally the, the things that really affect your business? I mean, is it just that seasonality? Is it the weather? Is it the economy? Uh, yeah, definitely the weather in other parts of the country, because, like, we don't we don't have the luxury to get all of our flowers locally. It's just, especially for weddings, it's very difficult because we don't have huge flower farmers here who have acres and acres and acres of just like the same type of flower. Um, so if the weather's bad, flowers die, we are out of what we wanted to order for that week. So we can't really source that local. Um, so we do get a lot of stuff not from Louisiana. Um, so yeah, weather comes into play with that. Um, economy here, 100%. I mean, I've felt it so many years. Some years were really bad, you know. Um, so yeah, the economy is definitely a big issue when it comes to weddings, because like, weddings are a luxury, you know, like not everyone just has 
all kind of money to spend on their wedding. So it's like if the dad of the bride is not doing so well with if he got laid off of work or like, you know, whatever, that will affect his daughter's wedding. Um, and it's a lot of tradition here in, in Louisiana. So it's, you know, it's the bride's family who pays for everything. And um, so, yeah, um, the economy is definitely a huge part of what affects us, I guess. Maybe when you were little, you wanted to be a rock and roll superstar and take over the world. And instead, you grew up uh, to be a part-time host on public radio. It's never a bad gig to do what you love, even if what you love to do isn't what you imagine it to be. It's the meaning in the work that matters, whether it's designing looks or designing spaces. Virginia and Mia, it's been great chatting with you both. Uh, thanks for joining me today on Out to Lunch. Thanks for having us. Thank you. My guests on Out to Lunch today have been hair and makeup artist Virginia Getting and Mia Sandberg, founder and owner of Root Floral Design. You can learn more about Virginia and Mia by following the links at our website, itsacadiana.com. The producer of our show is Grant Morris. Our technical producer is Eric Morrell. Our researcher is Ann Christian. And today's show was engineered by Blake Longley. You can listen to this show and to past episodes of Out to Lunch Acadiana wherever you get your podcast, including Spotify. And you can find all of our podcasts at itsacadiana.com. If you want to know what we look like, you can find photos from this show on itsacadiana.com, on our It's Acadiana Facebook page, and on Instagram at Out to Lunch Acadiana. These photos were taken by Lucius Fontenot, and you can find more of Lucius's photos at lafphoto.com. Out to Lunch is a production of INO Broadcasting for itsacadiana.com and KRBS 88.7 FM. I'm Christian Mader, editor of The Current, Lafayette's community-owned nonprofit newsroom. Thanks for joining me. For more great stories and conversation, check out thecurrentla.com and sign up for our weekly newsletter. I'll see you again here next week. Around the table for more business Acadiana style on Out to Lunch. Bye-bye. Out to Lunch Acadiana is recorded live at Spoonbill Watering Hole and Restaurant in downtown Lafayette. Spoonbill is open for lunch Tuesday through Sunday, dinner Wednesday through Saturday, and brunch on weekends. Spoonbill, tastes like good times. The Out to Lunch Acadiana theme music, Encore Monsieur, Nice Guy, is written by Mitchell Foreman and performed by Mitchell Foreman and Andre Michaud. Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base. JonesWalker.com. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. Support for Out to Lunch Acadiana comes from the Wyndham Garden Lafayette, located off Pinhook near Cali's Saloon. Wyndham Garden Lafayette is a pet and family-friendly hotel with reception space for large and intimate events, free parking, free Wi-Fi, and a free shuttle within three miles that includes the airport and downtown restaurants.